In our last video, we reviewed Mendel's laws of independent assortment, and we talked about that because there are two different ways in which the homologs can orient themselves to doing the division process of meiosis, you end up getting variations of the genes, and the genes don't necessarily always travel together. So two, homo two dominant traits would not necessarily always show up together, and two recessive traits would not necessarily always show up together, but you may end up getting different uh, combinations of these traits. However, this is only true if the genes are on separate chromosomes, and that's what we're going to be talking about in this video, a discovery made by Thomas Morgan about the idea of linked genes, which we talked about, referred to in the last video with the idea that some traits, including human traits, seem to travel together every time, and other traits that seem to be traveling together every time very rarely actually get broken. So we talked about the idea of linked genes, or and genes which should be linked but are somehow broken. And... Thomas Morgan was fascinated with this and wanted to understand what was happening and also understand why, it is, why is it that sometimes Mendel's law of independent assortment doesn't really make sense. So we're going to review all of that and talk about what discovery was made by Thomas Hunt Morgan. So Thomas Hunt Morgan worked with fruit flies and you see an example here of a fruit fly and you see her. her basic, in, in class we actually look at fruit flies in the microscope so you can see how one looks like. And you see that the actual genome or the karyotype that he was looking at, fruit flies have very few chromosomes, and so it's very easy for a scientist to track the DNA of these fruit flies across generations. And the thing that's interesting about fruit flies is that the first thing that he actually did was to study the eye color of fruit flies, and he realized something interesting about them. He realized that there was something called sex linkage in terms of the fruit flies. In other words, there seems to be something to do with the sex of the fruit fly for the eye color. That uh, the actual uh, pattern for fruit fly eye color was carried in the sex chromosomes. So that is a discovery he did first. But we're actually going to talk about that at later, because first I want to talk about what a linked gene is, period. And then we're going to go and come back and explain the sex linkage thing, which was, which was actually the first discovery that Thomas Morgan did. Okay, So the idea that he had was that Mendel's genes, you know, this idea that you have these genes which are the original parental gametes of his, of his study, were the homozygous dominant, the same way that Mendel started with homozygous dominant on his first generation, or the parental gametes, right, were always pure, right? So in, in this example, Men, uh, Morgan was looking at two genes at once, and he was looking at specific, specifically at two genes found in the same chromosome. Because here's the idea that Thomas Morgan had, basically. If you have independent assortment, you're going to have that, truly, if the genes are on separate chromosomes, like we talked on the previous video. So if these genes are on separate chromosomes, you're going to have equal chances of the genes are sorting independently, and you're going to have no linkage between the genes. However, what, what if this chromosome, this DNA molecule, contains thousands of genes inside each chromosome? Well, that means that as these chromosomes separate, they're always going to separate together. So imagine on this picture, if this chromosome G here had thousands of genes inside of it, any genes inside the chromosome would automatically travel together no matter what was happening with the other chromosomes. And that's the idea that Morgan had. So he basically says, two genes in the same chromosome, let's track them across generations. And let's see if Mendel's laws of independent assortment will hold. So he looks at a chromosome that's purely dominant. It has two dominant genes. Gene A is dominant, gene B is dominant, and so forth. And then he compares that with another chromosome that also has that. Now, according to, again, with what he said, you should always get, with something like this, a, um, because it's linked, right? The chromosomes are together, the genes are together in the same chromosome, you should always get children that look like this, right? But that's not exactly what you find. In fact, you find that sometimes the genes recom there's recombination between the genes, and the gametes which come from the parents are sometimes a mixture of both genes, and so we call these recombinant gametes, or the gametes that don't look like the parents do. All right? So we'll talk about what that means in a second. All right? So just have this in your mind. Parental gametes are pure for both traits, and recombinant gametes will be dominant for one and recessive for the other, instead of being just dominant for one for both or just recessive for both. Okay? So... Uh, he looked at a specific cross between two flies to discover this linkage thing. 
And to make sense out of this, the first thing you need to know is that big B, or sorry, uh, big B plus, all right, is going to go ahead and it's going to stand for gray. So big big plus stands for gray, and then B will stand for black. So it, and the B plus is dominant over the B. So that's our, that's our dominant gene right there. And I know this is a little different from the code that Mendel used. Mendel used big B, little b. But Morgan just wanted to keep one letter to represent or one code to represent each thing. And then he used the plus sign to represent dominance. All right. So this is a little different version of the genetic coding. So, and for the wings, if you have a VG plus, you have what is called your normal wings so vg plus you're going to have what's called the normal wings so as long as you have uh, one of these genes because that's the dominant you're going to display normal wings but if you have the vg without the plus you're going to have what's called vestigial wings and you can see how these looks in in, in the in the screen vestigial wings barely look like wings they have barely it's funny to see these flies trying to fly it's like they can't even move the best thing they can do is like a jump around and they are mutants, basically, right? It's what they call, he called the mutant type because that's a variation of the normal wild type uh, wings, right? So you see that this particular female over here, right, is going to have normal wings, right? And it's going to be a gray, gray body, which is the normal combination of black and white alternating colors. She's going to have a grayish body because she's actually heterozygous for both traits. Notice she has one dominant and one recessive for that and he also has one dominant and one recessive for this one right so we're talking about someone who is a heterozygous for both traits in this case and here you have someone who's homozygous recessive for both traits and therefore a male that's going to be black and have vestigial wings right now remember from what we learned in our genetics video that we're going to have a what are the gametes which are, this person can create? Remember, we talk about how to figure that out. If you have someone who's homozygous for two traits, that's two to the power of n, where n is two, so you're going to have four different gametes. And you see here that this person can actually make four gametes. Uh, this this fly will actually make each one of these possible gametes here. So this gamete is, is homozygous dominant for both, homozygous dominant for one, but recessive for the other, and and so forth. Now, on this fruit fly here, because she's homozygous recessive for both, she can only make one type of gamete. Now, if you were to actually make a cross between these two, all right, so let's, do, let's actually do a quick Punnett square. Because you only have one type of gamete on the male, you're only going to need one column for that. So you're gonna, only going to need one column for the male carrying those genes. And then for the female, you're going to need four columns because you have four types of gametes, like this shows. So if you were to do a Punnett square about this, you would actually see that the, the gametes of the female, so B plus, VG plus, and then you have the B plus with the VG, and then you're going to have the B with the VG, which is the recessive for both traits, VG plus, and the recessive for both traits. Okay, so we got that. Now, if you actually were to create or things here, you find this particular person here, the, the, our particular fertilized organism is going to be B plus B, so heterozygous for that, so therefore gray, and it is also going to be have vestid, normal wings because it's going to be heterozygous. So basically here you just made mom again, and you see the wild type right there, just like mom, that's the first one you make, right? The second one you theorize to make if Mendelian genetics is supposed to be happening is you're going to be make another B plus and a B, so it's going to be normal again or wild type for the color of the body. However, you're going to get VG without the plus twice here, so you're going to be someone who's going to be normal wings, but is going normal color, but is going to have vestigial wings. So you're going to see something. You see that over here, right? And then if you're going to do this one, you get someone who's recessive for both genes from mom and dad for the for the color but the wings is going to be heterozygous so you see that right here it's going to see a, no, a black body with normal wings and then finally you have something that's recessive for both traits and that's the last one here which is the black vestigial type 
which looked like the dad did. Now, you see that doing the normal genetics Punnett square that Mendel would have devised, you would expect to find a 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 ratio of genotype distributions. So sh there should be equal chances of these genotypes across them. So that means that if you were to have thousands of offspring, 2,300 offspring, you should ex you're um, more than expected to see uh, this ratio of, the, of this, this, this position. So if you have, you have, you're trying to have that many kids, you should have 575 of each according to the Punnett square that Mandel expected. But in fact, what actually happened is that he got 965 that looked like the mother or the wild type of the mother, 944 that looked like the, the, the mutant type for both traits like the dead, and he called that the parental phenotypes. Remember, parental phenotypes are the phenotypes or the genotypes that match the parents. And then you have two of these which do not match the parents, which we, he called the recombinant phenotypes. So the phenotypes that do not match the parents. So now he has a question in his mind, what exactly is happening here? What explains this? And he spends years studying chromosomes until he comes up with the realization that chromosomes in the same gene do not assort independently in the way that Mendel predicted. And that furthermore, because of crossing over, there is breakage of that linkage that he also discovered. I know, we'll talk about that in the next video and explain what was these findings that he was looking at over here.